Hi, everyone. This is AJ Woodhams, host of the War Books podcast, where I interview today's best authors writing about war related topics. Really excited today to have Benjamin Carp uh, on the show with his new book, The Great New York Fire of 1776 A Lost Story of the American Revolution. Benjamin Carp is professor of history at Brooklyn College in the CUNY Graduate Center. He is the author of the books Defiance of the Patriots, The Boston Tea Party, and The Making of America, and Rebels Rising, Cities in the American Revolution. Professor Carp, how are you doing today? Great, AJ. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming on the show. Uh, you know, I have to admit, and I think this is why you made the title like this, um, A Lost Story, I knew nothing about this fire uh, up until reading your book. And I even I even went on this whole, I moved to New York City in 2019. I was there for three years. And uh, have you ever heard of the Bowery Boys? I have, yeah. I went on this whole New York City history binge. And I thought I learned everything there was to know about New York City. And lo and behold, this is this very pivotal event is something new to me. They they did a podcast on it, actually. They did really? a podcast on the New York fire. Yeah, they got swept up, as some people do, in the question of whether Nathan Hale was involved. Oh, okay. So, uh, you know, that, that sometimes, uh, you know, leads people down a bit of a rabbit hole. Um, okay. Well, I must have, I don't know, I must have passed by that episode or, or something like that. Or maybe I, you know, maybe it's just like I... You know, it's it's lots of big cities have fires. Listen, and... I have a theory about this, which is that the reason why you've never heard of it and lots of your audience members have probably never heard of it is that there has been something of a deliberate effort to make it a historically insignificant event. Over well, the and we will definitely get to that because that is one of my questions that I, <laughs> that I have for you. But first, maybe let's just start off. What made you want to write this book? Well, this is something I've been interested in for actually 26 years. As an undergraduate, I got interested in the question of what firefighters did during the revolution, fire as political symbolism, destructive actions during the Revolutionary War. And at first, it was all a jumble. And I wrote a bad junior seminar paper about all these things. And eventually, I wrote my senior thesis on firefighters. That later became an article that I published. But but I never let go of this question of the burning of New York City. When I first came across this, I was like, what? How could the second largest city in the colonies, uh, and today the largest city in the country, have burned during the American Revolution? And they don't, and historians don't really like have a firm opinion on what happened. I was like, there's got to be something more interesting to this story. And, and this was my, that summer in 1997 was my first encounter with one of the primary sources that's really a core of this book which are 40 interviews that were done by the British in, in October, mostly October 1783, investigating the fire. And so looking into that source and other sources has just been something I've been doing occasionally uh, over the years. And then I was finally like, you know what, this needs to be its own book. It can't just be an article. I really need to, to get this out there in a way and, and tell this story in the fullest way possible. Very cool. Well, let's dive right into the story then. Okay. Let's start before the revolution, actually. Tell us just a little bit about pre revolutionary New York City. Kind of how big was it? What kinds of people lived there? Give us, sure. uh, give us the backdrop. Sure. New York City was, you know, didn't really exist much above Canal Street. The rest of Manhattan was largely rural. Uh, there were only about 25,000 people, which was enough to make it the second largest town in the British colonies. I mean, if you compare it to Mexico City or London at the time, you know, it's nothing. It's a small town. It's a trading outpost. Very ethnically and religiously diverse. However, uh, the Church of England was, you know, was, uh, dominated much of the elite. But you also have Presbyterians, Congregationalists, French Huguenots, Dutch Reform, German Lutheran any number of other denominations, Jews, maybe a smattering of Catholics. So, so it's a religiously very diverse city. It's not a city with one kind of feel to it, the way Philadelphia had a Quaker feel to it, or Boston had a, a congregationalist feel to it. Instead, what united New Yorkers was making money and getting drunk. <laughs> uh, you know, I had a chapter in Rebels Rising on the taverns of New York City and how important they were for political mobilization in the years leading up to the revolution. So that's what New York is like. Politically, uh, it had always been factionalized one way or another. And on the eve of the revolution, it had a significant population of loyalists in addition to a significant 
population of the Sons of Liberty who really um, ended up angling for independence. Well, one of the things that I just kind of like thinking about New York City as a setting, one of the things that I found was was interesting that you write about that I think is still like, at least the the concept of it is still true today, is you you contrast New York City with New England and how New England, New Englanders are kind of like more like more religious, more conservative. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about about New Yorkers versus New Englanders. Yeah, more, I mean, more conservative in some ways. I mean, New Yorkers tended to have more moderate politics, I guess. You could say in some ways that the New Englanders were actually more radical. I mean, it was a somewhat more egalitarian society. Uh, you know, religiously, they were a little bit more hot than I think most New Yorkers were. So in some ways, right, New England was very much the more radical place. But yeah, New Englanders and New Yorkers definitely had a lot of rivalries with one another. Some some of this was about upstate land claims, right? Uh, the disputed territory that then became Vermont, right, was a big New England versus New York kind of thing. But there was, you know, you know, New Englanders had a reputation as being, yeah, sharp elbowed and fanatical. Uh, and, you know, and, uh, and but New Yorkers had this reputation of being sinful and selfish, you, you know. So uh, when they met each other, right, they didn't always get along. And this becomes important in 1776, where from basically the beginning of the year all the way up until September 15th, New York City is occupied by the Continental Army, which is largely composed of New Englanders. So you really get this kind of clash on the streets between this visiting New England occupying force and the local New Yorkers, at least until the New Yorkers realize, oh, there's about to be like a war in our backyards and let's move out to the countryside uh, to keep our families safe. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about the revolution. Before we talk about New York City specifically, you write in your book that 1776 was the most destructive year in American history, not just in like the revolution, but in American history. Tell me why you think that is. I mean, I, you know, I, I haven't measured this, right? So don't, you know, quote me on that quantitatively, but it is a year of destruction. I mean, even if we if we're just metaphorical about it, it's the year when they sever the connection with Great Britain. And what that ends up involving is a lot of destruction. You know, we would want to look at the, the campaign that the rebels launched against the Cherokee in, you know, in what's today, the, you know, the area around Tennessee, they, they burned, you know, tons of, of Cherokee, Eastern Cherokee villages. It was destructive in the sense that the year starts out with the burning of Norfolk, Virginia, uh, which was the sixth largest uh, town in the 13 colonies. The British begin shelling it, and then Virginia and North Carolina militiamen on the rebel side come in and burn about 85% of it. And, uh, you know, and there, there, was, there were destructive events in the Caribbean. There was a saboteur who began wandering around England, destroying things. So you could find incidents of destruction in a lot of different places. You know, the bur burning of farms in Brooklyn, you know, after the Battle of Brooklyn uh, the bur and before the burning of New York City itself, a fifth of it. So it's a, a very destructive year. I mean, the war as a whole involves a lot of destructive incidents, more than we sometimes appreciate. Uh, it's particularly devastating in Indian country, but, uh, but a lot of the colonists' settlements were burned during the war as well. So yeah, it's it's a uniquely destructive year, I think. And so what's this doing to 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 the citizenry, to to people who are living in the colonies? You know, oftentimes in war, you know, maybe maybe the 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 fear of saboteurs is more more pronounced than it actually is, but it sounds like in this case maybe it 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 was fear that was well founded. What what are the feelings of people uh, in America? I mean, it's true that the fear is sometimes greater, and this is a big debate in the history of slavery, right? You know, when you know, when fires are blamed on enslaved people, are these real incidents of resistance and rebellion, or are they trumped up, you know, incidents of white paranoia? Right. Uh, this is a really interesting debate that I don't believe has been completely settled yet. But uh, you know, fi fire was the you know was often something that conspiracy theorists would be afraid of. But in the case of the beginning of the Revolutionary War in 1775, there were three fires that I think were uh, were really important. The burning of Charlestown, Massachusetts during the Battle of Bunker Hill, right in sight of Boston. The burning of Falmouth in, in what's now Maine in October of 1775. 
and the British burning of some some houses in on Connecticut Island in Jamestown, Rhode Island, again right across the uh, an inlet from from Newport. So it, it, you know, in the two major metropolitan centers of New England and along the down east along the main coast, New Englanders had witnessed the British burning towns, and this then makes it into the Declaration of Independence as a grievance. You know, the King George III he has burnt our towns. Uh, now, the, the Americans kind of lump Norfolk into that and say that it was the British fault and kind of like are in denial about the fact that the Americans had done this, too. And uh, and, the, and the Americans also were willing to, you know, uh, invade Boston, even if it meant destroying Boston when the British were occupying it. So the Americans, too, were willing to countenance the burning of towns and cities as an act of warfare. And it's an interesting game that I think the Americans play, which is to blame the British for everything that happens and say, this is a wanton act of destruction. This affects civilians. This is, you know, not a fair way of making war. This is how the king treats his subjects. Look at how unjust he is. But kind of playing a double game with that, where they too were kind of, you know, oh, we're going to be so patriotic as to use scorched earth tactics. We would rather burn our own towns than see them occupied by the British. So they're kind of talking about out of both sides of their mouth when it comes to destructive incidents during the war. And so let's then let's let's talk about New York City specifically. So talk about the military situation in in New York City during the revolution. How many so 25,000 civilians live there? How many uh soldiers in the Continental Army are there? And and why was New York City so important to Washington? Yeah, I mean New York City is definitely the most strategically important place at that moment. Uh, everyone knows that, you know, the British have ev- had evacuated Boston on uh, St. Patrick's Day in 1776, and they went to Nova Scotia to hang out, wait for more reinforcements to come. But a giant armada of, I think, something like 40,000 soldiers and sailors is is in the process of landing in New York Harbor. It had, the Hessian soldiers are there, you know, British troops, Brit- British, uh, the British Navy, uh, the, you know, the largest amphibious force that had been seen in the world in years. Uh, and, and Washington knows that he has to make some kind of stand there, you know, if you, if he wants to be taken seriously, right? Once the British get control of Manhattan Island, they have access to New Jersey, they have access to Connecticut, they have access to the Hudson River Valley, they can possibly make links up to the uh, Hudson Lake Champlain corridor, which the, gives them connections to uh, Quebec, where there's a, another major British force. So, uh, you know, so John Adams rightly says that New York is kind of a key to the whole continent. Um, and so uh, the idea that Washington would just let the British have it uh, was untenable. Uh, and so Washington has probably about the same number of men as the Howe brothers do, the British general and admiral. But he has to keep them spread out because, of course, New York is an archipelago and he's got a lot of different places to defend. He's got to defend Paulusuk, New Jersey. He's got to defend Manhattan. He's got to defend Brooklyn. He's got to defend Kingsbridge. Right. He's, you know, he has to station troops in a lot of different places because the the British have a lot of maneuverability with the Navy and all those transport ships. And so the British can concentrate their forces wherever. And Washington's not exactly sure where they're going to land. Uh, and what the British decide to do at the end of August is land on uh, on Long Island first and take Brooklyn. And then rapidly, they take Western Queens as well. And from there, they've got a very efficient staging point for landing pretty much anywhere on Manhattan Island that they choose. So, so Washington's force in, so both, both, both forces are about 40,000. I would say, yeah, I don't have the numbers uh, very well off the top of my head for the American side, but it's, let's say it's roughly equivalent. So how many, so you've got, I know you said they're spread out, but how many soldiers are just kind of like packed into like a very dense, you know, lower Manhattan? Certainly not the whole army. Definitely not. Right. Only, uh, I, I don't remember how many brigades or regiments it is, but you know certainly there is a, a, an occupying army in the urbanized part of Lower Manhattan, and some controversy over whether it should be New England soldiers or or New York soldiers holding that post. The New Yorkers didn't really trust the New Englanders; they thought they would put the torch to New York as soon as things started to get ugly, and so there was there was some dispute about that among the American troops. And I guess the, the reason I ask is like I'm just I'm curious about. So you've got 25,000 people in New York City and a large amount of soldiers. I guess I'm just like curious. Like... Well, well, okay. But as things start to heat up, of course, the civilian population begins to flee and people begin okay. to say that the civilian population has largely deserted. So again, as soon as soldiers begin to show up in big numbers, 
uh, it gets very uncomfortable for the, the loyalists who live there. Uh, but even people with patriot sympathies, unless they were trying to make money as contractors to the army, they were getting their families out of there because no one knew when you know, the, 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 the Americans might provoke the British Navy into bombarding the city, which they were doing very early on in 1776. And so again, if you could and you had family or the, the money to get out of New York, you were taking your family outside New York when you could. And so some of the emptied houses uh, were then used as shelter for the soldiers. And so what were the, what were the feelings, where were the, where did the sympathies lie of most New Yorkers? Were most of them loyalists or most of them supportive of the This rebels? is another big controversy, actually. I mean, look, we didn't ha- we don't have opinion polling, so we don't know what was deep in the hearts uh, of a lot of these people. Among the New Englanders, New York had a reputation of being very loyalist, in part because the New York provincial delegation tended to be pretty moderate. They dragged their feet about, you know, uh, about the question of independence, uh, etc. And so a lot of New Englanders and other really radical patriots were frustrated with New Yorkers. And so New York got a reputation as being kind of not as radical as some of the other American colonies. And the city definitely had some prominent and important loyalists, right? Uh, uh, ministers in the Church of England, uh, very wealthy conservatives in the Delancey family, uh, you know, merchants who, you know, cherished their connection to the British Empire. So again, there, there, there's a prominent set of loyalists. But as to whether New York City was majority loyalist, there are some historians like Philip Ranlett, you know, who, who have their doubts and say, no, you know, New York City had a strong Sons of Liberty contingent. Um, they sent a lot of uh, men who became officers in the Continental Army, like John Lamb and Marinus Willett. And, uh, you know, the, these were, you know, some of the core New York City patriots. So again, it's 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 a little tricky to to be able to judge how how rebellious uh, New York City was as a town. But of course, once you have armies right in the picture, that's going to you know put the thumb on the scales because you know who wants to hang out with a hostile army if the rebel army is occupying you know and Washington is there in April and the American army is there all the way to September fifteenth. You know, how many loyalists are going to be comfortable unless they're actively spying for the British or really paranoid about their own property and trying to hold out, right? So you're going to flee. And so then if you were to go around the streets of New York in 1776 and say, hey, do you support the rebel army? Of course you would say, yes, I support the rebel army. But then when the British come in, all of a sudden you see lots of people taking oaths of loyalty to the British army. And are they doing that for the purposes of expediency or because they have uh, a a deeply felt loyalty to King George III? That's really hard. Um, You know, sometimes you don't have the luxury of being able to state your choice freely. Uh, when there are occupying soldiers marching through the streets. Yeah. And I, you know, you get that sense. You, you touch on this later on in in your book when you're talking about, you know, who gets to, you know, it's, it's the victor that, that gets to tell the story about, you know, how, how these events unfolded. Well, and again, because New York city was then occupied by the British army all the way from September of 1776 to evacuation day on November 25th, 1783, Right. That also, in retrospect, makes New York look like a not very patriotic town because they you could say that they were collaborators. Right. With the with the British Army. Right. Serving them drinks, you know, uh, worshiping with them, you know, what have you. Um, So, you know, for that reason, also, in retrospect, New York City doesn't have as patriotic a reputation as Boston or Philadelphia. And talk about let's talk about then the the British their invasion of of New York City. Talk a little bit about the lead up to that invasion. So we've got the Continental Armies in New York City. Talk about the lead up to that invasion and and then talk about what happens when they actually do invade. Yeah, I mean, to me, the the what, what the British are doing is kind of cut and dried, right? They have the superior naval force. You, you know, they execute a a set of brilliant maneuvers to to take Brooklyn. Washington that's then gets very lucky being able to evacuate his army from Brooklyn. And it seems pretty inevitable that the British are going to be able to take Lower Manhattan too. The really surprising thing is that they miss opportunities to really cut off Washington's army and crush or capture it, Uh, you know, because they were being a little bit cautious. They didn't really know what was over the next hill. And so, you know, in retrospect, in hindsight, it kind of looks like, oh, the British could have won an even bigger victory, but instead they were cautious and they, they let a lot of Washington's army get away while still... Uh, taking their objectives. It then takes them a little while to dislodge Washington from upper Manhattan up in the Heights. So there are some criticisms of what the British do, but they do lock down, you know, lower New York City without too much trouble. What's more interesting to, for the purposes of my book is Washington's decision making. I mean, Washington really has three choices. 
He can stand and defend. And if he does that, his army is likely to get wiped out or captured. He can leave the city for the British and just retreat. Or he can say, hey, I don't want to give the British all the advantages that New York City will give to the British. I'm going to burn this place behind me. And so this is an idea that's being floated among his officers and soldiers. Uh, and this is what you know sets the stage, I think, for, for the fire of September 21st. Yeah. And the Continental Army at this time, too, you write about this. They're they're kind of terrified uh, of the the British invading, and they start to desert. Correct? Yeah. The, the uh, um, it's funny. Most of the work that's been done on mutiny in the Continental Army focuses on some really big mutinies that happened later in the war, 1780, 1781, even 1783. But but the Army of 1776, I think, is under studied by historians, and it seems like it was a pretty. Uh, uh, disobedient army with a lot of inclinations to desertion. Militiamen from New England uh, had a particularly bad reputation for just up and going home or having their friends come to retrieve them and, and get home. Washington it, it, you know, is, is disgusted with a lot of his troops, especially the militia. And he's been writing to Congress saying, hey, I need a better better rules for being able to punish disobedient soldiers. I need you to up the maximum number of lashes I can give a sh- soldier from 39 to 100. Uh, I need to be able to execute people for a wider number of crimes. I'm really having trouble keeping this army under control. And an obedient army is going to be a more successful army. I need to be able to extend enlistments. I need to be able to tighten discipline. He is really worried about about the state of his army in 1776. And so then he he ultimately makes the decision. Like you said, there there aren't there's not too much violence in the the taking uh, of the city. He ultimately makes the decision to to withdraw back. Then right? Yeah, I mean, he, I think he would have hoped that the soldiers at Kipps Bay would have made more of a stand. But all of a sudden, this barrage of cannonballs starts landing in front of them. The officers themselves, I don't think, acquit themselves very well, and the soldiers up and run. Uh, and the and the soldiers stationed down in New York City also realize that they're about to be cut off if they don't run. And so they begin fleeing up Manhattan Island as fast as they can. I mean, the retreat is so massive that uh, Washington actually has to station people at Kingbridge, Kingsbridge with their guns pointed at the retreating soldiers saying, no, don't go past here. We're still, you know, g- going to be staying here in in Washington Heights. And so, yeah, I mean, It's a successful retreat on Washington's part in that not as many people were captured as could have been captured, but uh, a a lot of people felt that the soldiers behaved in a pretty disgraceful way and didn't make a a, a braver stand. Yeah, and I think you you also mentioned that not everybody, not all of the soldiers made it out during the evacuation, and so they eventually just were like melding back into the population and and kind of carrying on as if they had never served in the Continental Army. Well, this is, yeah, this comes up in oblique ways in the evidence that some of them may have stayed behind deliberately, you know, uh, taken off their uniforms and tried to blend in uh, either just to, you know, for self-preservation uh, or because possibly they had designs to linger among the soldiers, wait for the British soldiers to get comfortable and then burn the city down. Now, again, it's really hard to you know, have definitive evidence for that. But um, it does seem clear, right? I have a source saying, hey, I recognize some people who were in the Continental Army who were still there after the British had raised the Union Jack over, you know, over Fort George. So, you know, there were definitely people before the fire who said things are looking a little sketchy. And the Americans have been swearing all summer that they will burn the city as soon as, you know, as soon as they have to retreat. You know, this is going to be a pretty scary time. Uh, and, and in fact, the guy who's appointed the fire chief, John Baltus Dash, buries his valuables in the backyard two days before the fire because he thinks this fire is about to happen. Well, so why does why is everybody convinced that because you, you as you just mentioned, there are a lot of rumors that Washington's just going to burn the place to the ground. Why? Why are people afraid of this? People are afraid of this because it made strategic sense for Washington to burn the city, right? I mean, if he leaves the city to the British, they get naval headquarters, they get winter headquarters for the army, they can begin establishing a marketplace for farmers to come in. Uh, You know, it'll be a place of refuge for loyalists and also a place of welcome for Americans who aren't sure of their political loyalties, right? Right. 
it, it'll have all these advantages. And also people knew that there were a lot of elements on the rebel side that really hated New York. They hated the loyalists who lived in New York. They hated some of the wealthy people who lived in New York. They were disgusted with the prostitution district behind Trinity Church and St. Paul's. They, they hated the presence of the Church of England who owned a lot of that land behind those churches. So, they, they, you know, there were a lot of elements of the Continental Army that were out for revenge for the towns that the British had burned in 1775. So there are a lot of reasons on the ground. And you have this disobedient army and you never knew what an ordinary soldier might do. So there are, there's a lot of fear on the ground uh, that the Americans had a lot of very good reasons, both emotional and rational, why they, why they might want to burn New York. Well, let's get to the fire then. So talk about, you know, give us kind of a play by play. You know, when did the fire start? And, and from your research, how did it start? Yeah, the fire started bet- probably between the hours of midnight and 1 a.m. And here I tell the story, I think, as coherently as I can. But what I was dealing with were a lot of conflicting accounts of, of, of what really took place. There were some people who said, there was one fire that started on Whitehall Slip, so down at the tip of Manhattan, possibly something completely accidental, possibly the origins of it were murky, but that there, uh, you know, that appears to have been an origin point. But other people say, hey, no, I saw the fire break out at three places at a distance from one, one another simultaneously, 10 places at a distance from one another simultaneously, 15, right? And so multiple ignition points would suggest that, you know, that there was uh, something deliberate happening in a coordinated attack. On the other hand, almost every account mentions that the wind was high. And so it is clear that the wind helped the fire spread, right? Uh, New York's buildings were covered in wooden shingles. If you've ever seen video of the Paradise Fire in California, uh, you know about the concept of flaming brands, right? The idea of the wind picking up something flammable that's on fire, blowing that flammable thing to you know, another tree or a roof, and then that catches fire. And that that can happen really fast and cause a fire to spread over a very large area. And if you look at the maps that were made of New York City after the fire, what you end up seeing is this big gray or blank area showing the, the destroyed part of New York City. And it's relatively contiguous and might suggest that the fire was uh, accidental and that it was mostly spread by the wind. But on the other hand, most of the eyewitnesses, now granted these eyewitnesses were mostly loyal to the British Army or a Navy one way or another, but a lot of eyewitnesses said, hey, this really looked deliberate to me. I saw people carrying combustible materials. I saw people holding flaming torches, uh, you know, and running away. I saw, you, you know, caches of combustible materials that seemed like they were deliberately laid in order to accelerate a deliberate fire, whether it was gunpowder or turpentine or, or things like that. And so, and so what you see on the ground is, is chaos in some ways. And eyewitnesses were doing their best to make sense of it. Now, there were efforts to fight the fire. Civilian firefighters, British soldiers, British sailors all come out in order to do their best to contain the fire, even though it was raging, you know, beyond what what a small fire engine would have been capable of combating. Uh, General James Robertson, the common, British commandant, later claims that he diverted the fire from the most valuable part of the city, the East River docks, such that the fire went up Broadway instead and burned his own mansion. Uh, because he had a mansion there uh, ever since the Seven Years' War. And so instead, uh, what the fire does is it sort of leaps over Broadway, goes around Bowling Green, leaps over Broadway, and then destroys pretty much everything west of Broadway to, to the Hudson River up to what's now about Park Place, uh, where, where City Hall Park is. Uh, and it just, it does skip some of the big mansions that were made of masonry uh, or, or stone on Broadway, but all of the wooden, more working-class housing on Trinity Church land west of Broadway all goes up in smoke. The Customs House is destroyed, Trinity Lutheran Church is destroyed, and Trinity Church, which was probably one of the largest buildings, if not the largest building in New York City, uh, was destroyed in a vast pyramid of fire. Um, you know, and this was the symbol of Anglican power in New York City. Uh, and uh, you know, it was the oldest and most important church uh, of the Church of England in New York City, and uh, you know, and, and therefore the, for the most important one for miles around. And it, it goes up in it goes up in flames. So if you were going to put a, a percentage on the percentage of the city that gets destroyed in this fire, what would you say? Yeah, Mapmaker and I tried to figure this out. And it's tricky because knowing the denominator, you know, how many buildings New York had, maybe 4,200, but it looks like 20% of the urbanized part of New York City burned. So a fifth of the city 
is burned. And, and Washington later says, you know, oh, gosh, like, I wish more of it had burned, you know, and, and there were plenty of other patri patriots who said, uh, it's too bad that the fire wasn't more successful, uh, you know, because uh, it really didn't destroy the most militarily and commercially valuable part of New York City. It didn't destroy the docks and, and naval repair facilities down on the East River. Yeah. And one of the, the reasons that you write that this, the, this fire was so destructive, and this also um, gives credence to the rumors that it was intentional, is a lot of the equipment that normally would be used to fight fires or warn people had been taken away. So the church, the church bells are the one I'm thinking of. But talk, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, New York City on September 21st was not very well equipped to fight a fire. I mean, so much of the civilian population was gone. And of course, you need civilian help in bucket brigades during a fire. Many of the firemen who had expertise working the fire engines had also left the city. Some of them had joined the army. Some of them had just left, uh, you know, to keep their families safe. So you don't have any firefighters. The bells had been taken all out of the churches in order to be melted down and turned into cannon. You know, so that would have been the alarm that would have given an early warning to turn, wake everybody up and turn them out for a fire. And a lot of the firefighting equipment was damaged. Some people even said that there were people damaging fire equipment during the fire, cutting the handles of fire buckets, uh, trying to like move, fi grab the firefighting hose away from the firefighters while they were trying to fight the fire. So tampering with equipment is one of the things that uh, the British Commission in 1783 is asking witnesses about because they had heard rumors of active interference with firefighting and prior damage to firefighting equipment that made firefighting harder. So how long did the fire burn for? Uh, the fire probably burned for about 10 hours, maybe 12 until the wind shifted and they could put out any remaining fires and get it under control. But for hours, it, it had achieved flashover. It was raging at a very high temperature. There's only so much you can do with water. I mean, at some point, what you have to do is start tearing down houses in order to give that fire nowhere to go. I mean, there was nothing you could do to deprive that fire of oxygen. All you could do was deprive that fire of, of further fuel. And what that means is pulling down houses, destroying more houses. Uh, and this was something that fire companies throughout the colonial period were empowered to do, and in fact had to do when a fire got big enough. And New York City had been lucky up to this point. I mean, Montreal, Boston, Charleston, South Carolina had all had fires that had destroyed entire neighborhoods during the colonial period. New York City had been pretty lucky up to this point. They'd had, you know, pretty small fires for the most part that had only destroyed a handful of buildings at most. Yeah, well, let's talk about the aftermath uh, of the fire. So, you know, obviously people have been thinking for a while, you know, Washington's going to burn the city down. The British invade, the city burns down. Talk a little bit about, about the aftermath of the fire. Yeah, I mean, there's different things we could say. One is that we could talk about, well, did the British like arrest anybody? I mean, we haven't gotten to this yet, but they actually execute a pe few people during the fire. They stab at least one to death with bayonets. They throw a bunch of people into burning buildings because they caught them on the spot as incendiaries. And so they summarily execute them. Then after the fire, they round up maybe as few as 20 people, maybe as many as 100 or 200 people and put them in jail and then later parade them before witnesses to kind of see like, oh, did you see one of these people committing acts of incendiarism? But not, not too much comes of that. I mean, there are some Br American officers who are made into POWs and accused of having been involved in setting the fire. But it seems like most of the civilians are just released for lack of good evidence. The, you know, it doesn't really slow down the British army that much. They had planned an attack on Polisuk, New Jersey for the 21st. Instead, they take it two days later on the 23rd. You know, and then meanwhile, the British army is further up on Manhattan trying to dislodge George Washington from the heights. So as far as the British army is concerned, they move on with their lives. New York, I mean, New York ends up having a really bad housing crisis as a result of this over the, you know, in that coming winter. Uh, and it's because 20% of the housing stock has now been destroyed. And they never restore that neighborhood. That neighborhood becomes known even until after the war as Canvas Town, because you have some brick shells of buildings with uh, with sail canvas stretched over them as shelter. Uh, and there are, you know, fugitive self-emancipated enslaved people who take shelter there, uh, sailors, poor people who are in this area that doesn't really get rebuilt until much later. Uh, and so that's another important element of the aftermath. But one of the other elements of the aftermath that I get really interested in is how does this play in the press? Because initially, there are people in ar American army camps who are like, yes, we finally did it. It was definitely our guys who did it. And then the, uh, you know, the American public opinion making 
uh, apparatus gets to work. Uh, people in Washington's army, in Continental Congress, in the newspaper, in the Patriot newspaper offices begin cranking up the propaganda machine. And they're like, uh, you know, Washington's army was pretty far away from this. Washington had asked Congress permission to burn the city beforehand, and they had said no. So we don't, you know, Washington definitely didn't do this. Uh, but what you really should pay attention to, you know, so it was probably an accident, but what you really should pay attention to is how monstrous the British are behaving. Hessian soldiers pl uh, plundering, uh, maybe a little bit true. Uh, you know, the, the British, you know, executing people on the spot. Okay, we know that was true. Uh, cutting people's throats from ear to ear. Uh, no, no evidence of that. Killing women and children. What? Like, you know, so in other words, pay attention to that, right? Like this kind of disinformation thing. Don't pay attention to the fact that the Americans had been threatening to burn the city all, uh, all summer and now the city has been burned, right? And so meanwhile, the British loyalist press is like, this was definitely deliberate. Uh, it, you know, we can point to all these pieces of evidence showing that this was definitely the case. But, the, you know, but the, those loyalist accounts do not penetrate. And instead, out beyond New York, what Americans are mostly reading is these more patriot accounts emphasizing British dastardliness and not really talking much about whether the Americans had burned or, and denying, frankly, that the Americans had burned New York City. I mean, in Washington's first letters after the fire, he's like, we don't know how this happened. You know, officially, we don't know. But meanwhile, then, you know, a few weeks later, he writes to his cousin and he says, Providence or some good, honest fellow has done what we didn't see fit to do for ourselves. And meanwhile, he's saying, God, Congress telling me not to burn New York City was a t huge mistake. I'm glad someone went ahead and did this, you know, or, or God somehow did this and it was an accident. You, you know, so again, like oh, historians look at this letter, which actually wasn't really well known among historians until the 1940s. Historians look at this letter and they're like, is Washington winking at us? Is he kind of saying like, yeah, Congress to, it, it, it told me not to, but isn't it great that it burned anyway in his private correspondence with his cousin? But officially, right, he, you know, it, it looks like he bears absolutely no responsibility for the fire. Those letters were made available to the public in the 1780s, the, car, the prior correspondence between Washington and Congress. And those really make it look like, you know, you know, good, good, good soldier. George Washington is listening to Congress and they told him not to burn New York City. And that's all we need to know. Of course, Washington also says, hey, if you're going to tell me to burn New York City, keep it a secret. And so do we, you know, it's possible that there's a letter that just doesn't survive where Congress is like, yeah, yeah, we know what we said publicly. But if you really need to burn the city behind you, you have our permission. Go ahead. You know, so is there besides this letter, is there any evidence that, that you uncovered in your research that that points to Washington intentionally burning the city? I mean, not not from Washington's own mouth. So there's no way, given the evidence we have now to hold Washington dead to rights. What we do have, though, are Washington vouching for three captains who were accused of involvement in the fire. Uh, there's a New England, there's a New England captain from Connecticut named Amos Fellow who dies in prison early in a British prison early in 1777. He was accused of having caught setting, been caught setting fire to New York and Washington right before this guy's death is like, Hey, this guy's getting really ill. Can you, you know, can you release him or move him to a safer climate so that he'll, you know, survive his captivity? So he's sticking up for that guy. Then you have another uh, officer who was supposedly captured a New Yorker who was supposedly captured Abraham Van Dyke also accused of uh, setting this place on fire. Uh, Washington's officers are vouching for him too. Oh, this guy was falsely accused. Later on in this guy's life, he actually kills a black soldier, a, a Patriot black soldier in the Connecticut encampment, asks for an acquittal, a, a court martial, gets acquitted. Washington approves this. And then later on, we're talking 1780 now, Washington says, hey, could we get this guy a Marine captaincy given his great service to the American cause? So he's sticking up for that guy. And then finally, there's a spy, Abraham Patton for the Patriots, who is hanged by the British in New Brunswick, New Jersey in June of 1777. According to, the, to a loyalist newspaper, on the gallows, he confesses to having been one of the people who burned New York City and would not name his accomplices. So he's hanged. And then Washington reads about this and he writes to John Hancock, hey, could we get this guy's widow and four children, orphan children, some money, but let's do it kind of privately given the line of work he was in. So again, these are three people supposedly with the rank of captain in the American army who were accused of setting fire to New York that Washington vouches for in some way. I mean, is that evidence? You know, it's, that's a little bit, you know, you know, not direct evidence, but still like, why, you know, why is Washington sticking up for these guys? You know, again, there are Americans who are willing to admit these were our people who did it. 
but again, right, like a, an actual document, you know, saying this was authorized and Washington did it and Washington gave a direct order to do it. I just don't think we're going to find that evidence. Although I hope that this book will be kind of a bat signal for other researchers who might come across something that I didn't in some random Connecticut archive or something, uh, where there will be something a little bit more direct connecting this to George Washington. Yeah, well, and what comes to my mind is is Occam's razor, right? The most obvious explanation is generally the explanation. You've got, you know, for months, people are saying New York City is probably going to get burned down if it's invaded by the British. Strategically, as you pointed out, it makes sense for Washington to, to burn down New York City. And then, you know, you've got the correspondence uh, that you were just talking about that that you know there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of hints here that and, uh, and, and yeah maybe it's possible that washington just said will no one rid me of this tr- meddlesome city and one of his enterprising <laughs> yeah. officers were like hmm this is what the boss wants you know i won't say anything to the boss but i'll take care of this but then there's another possibility which is that you know washington's army in 1776 was so disobedient that maybe they were like hey washington's telling me not to do that to hell with that. I'm burning this city. You know, what's he going to do? Right. I'm going to squirrel myself away and, you know, and I'm, I'm just going to do this on my own. So maybe there was a radical faction within the army and, and, and civilian population that just took it upon themselves. I mean, we know what kinds of, you know, politically radical actions some patriots were up to before the war started. Maybe this was a continuation of that. So there are some intriguing possibilities. Well, talk a little bit more about the after this fire happens, the propaganda that that ensues and what this fire does for uh, for 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 the purposes of each army are people energized on in the continental army by this are are the british um pretty upset what's what's kind of the how is how does the spin develop i mean the the british are really upset they're like this you know this just you know one of the loyalist newspapers says you know look at new you new yorkers who took up with the rebellion this is the thanks you get from the rebellion you know so think twice this is probably a good time for you to now declare your allegiance back to the king and you know you'll get a full pardon if you do so the british really think like everyone is is going to be so outraged by this that this is going to you know help the, the loyalist cause and so you know so that's you know, so that, but, but, the, and the, the, the British hopes are dashed in part because of this American propaganda campaign. Now, you would think that the Americans would be like, yeah, we did it and we did it as revenge and this is what happens during the war and you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. The Americans don't really do that. Instead, they basically duck responsibility for the fire, which enables them to say, hey, burning towns is something the British do, not us. And so, you know, this was an unfortunate accident, maybe, you know, but meanwhile, you know, pay attention to what the British are doing. They are invading more and more of our countryside uh, and, you know, and good patriots need to stand strong and join the Continental Army. I mean, the Continental Army is not doing very well in late 1776, um, you know, so it's it's a bad time. And if the British had been successful at kind of destroying Washington's army or taking Washington himself, the whole war might have been over. And the history of the fire and the history of the war and the history of the United States would all look a lot different. But Washington is able to escape beyond the Delaware River, and then he gets these important victories at Trenton and Princeton. And, you know, and the, and the Continental Army lives to fight another day. But late 1776 is actually not, you know, some, some historians call this the dark days of the American Revolution, one of the grimmest times where the Americans are basically losing every battle. They lose Long Island. They lose Manhattan. They end up losing most of New Jersey for a time. Uh, but then the British army ends up committing all these atrocities and making, you know, the British cause even more unpopular. And so the Americans really win the propaganda aspect of 1776. And I think the the, the way the fire is uh, talked about in the press is a big part of that story. Well, let's let's talk about once the war ends. What, how is this? How is how is the fire? Uh, how How does the story of the fire develop after the war? Well, after the war, I mean, I hold two sources responsible for how historians talk about the fire. One is this correspondence between Washington and Congress, right? People love Washington. He's the father of the country. They read Washington dutifully writing to Congress, asking permission and Congress saying no. They read that and they say, well, that's all I need to know. Clearly, Washington was not responsible. And so if you read, say, Justice John Marshall's biography of Washington, they're like, well, maybe it was some miscreants who did it, but Washington himself was definitely not responsible. Um, And in fact, there are some early histories that talk about Washington's correspondence with Congress, but then don't even mention that a fire happened 
which, you know, it's like, so like, clearly like the fire itself is like, well, that's not historically important. Forget about that, you know. And then the other thing in, within New York, within historians of New York City, right, 19th century historians of New York City, they realize like, hey, New York City's revolutionary story doesn't look that good. The British were occupying most of the time. How can we make New York City part of the American story? And they get very lucky in the account of a German American tavern keeper named David Grimm. Now, David Grimm was a loyalist and he serves drinks to German officers throughout the war. He was important in Trinity Church, which had been destroyed during the fire. He, and then actually after, after the war, he's kind of a little bit afraid of staying in New York. So he goes to a spa in Germany for a year, part, supposedly for his health, but also to kind of like avoid like being beaten up or having his property confiscated. And then he comes back and things were a little uncomfortable, but then he, 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 he gets rich. He becomes a one percenter. He's behind a lot of New York City's early financial institutions. At one point, a newspaper criticizes him for his political positions and is like, hey, wait a minute, that guy was a loyalist during the, during the war. And so I think he like got a little bit of afra afraid of that kind of coverage. And so he leaves an account. Now this account, he doesn't, it, it isn't, doesn't appear in print until the 1820s, but he leaves an account, which kind of implies that the fire had had a single point of origin, that it had mostly been the wind that had spread it, that the British soldiers on the spot had executed people in arbitrary fashion. And he doesn't outright say that the fire was an accident, but it's definitely an account that kind of makes it look like, oh, you, you know, the, the, the Americans didn't really do this on purpose. And, and every single, uh, you know, history of New York that mentions the fire tends to use Grimm's account. I mean, he gives this very precise and probably too low figure for the number of buildings that was burned, 493. And so historians look at that and be like, oh, this was this kindly antiquarian who had been a loyalist who gives this very precise figure. That's the most accurate account of the fire. But it's not clear whether he was there. It's not, you know, and, and also I, you know, I, I think he was, you know, he was actually a politically important figure who I think needed to give a kind of pro-US version of events. And so I think he's the other account that led historians to be like, oh, well, I guess the fire wasn't really a historically significant event. I guess it really was something accidental, or maybe we'll never know. But clearly, we're not going to see it as something of big political or military significance, right? Like, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of towns were burned during the war. Most of them were burned by the British. This isn't an important part of the story. And what's interesting to me is that over the years, there have been occasional exceptions, you know, uh, memoirists or historians who said, you know what, it actually does look pretty likely that the Americans did this. And why can't we be honest about this? But keep in mind, right, like saying anything against George Washington at most periods of our history, right, was, you know, was an extremely unkosher thing to do. You know, and so you're you're not going to see it. I mean, you're not going to see that. Even British historians by the late 19th century are getting into the act. They kind they kind of admired Washington, and they were like, "Yeah, you know what? Um, I agree with the American accounts. I guess the Americans didn't really do it." And so, and uh, you know, and the British really had no in interest in um, making a big deal out of this fire because you know the balance sheet, right? It, it, you know, the British had burned a lot of towns themselves. The British had committed these summary executions on the night of the fire. I think both sides had an interest in like. Just burying this 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 story and 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 letting it gather cobwebs. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I can imagine you know Washington after the war. Uh, I imagine is just like this larger than life figure, and you've got this new country, and you know the the dark moments. You know, Valley Forge is like the only like dark moment from Washington. That, that I know of. But you that's heroism maybe... through suffering, right? I mean, that all, that makes Washington look good, right? Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean you're, you're totally right about this. I'm sorry, I'm, I keep interrupting, but I'm a New Yorker no. and that's how we show we pay attention. But yeah, um, no, I mean, it, I mean, yeah, Washington's the father of his country. He's basically untouchable. Yeah. Yeah, well, you, you write towards the end of the book that... Well, let me just ask you about this story because it's been kind of forgotten. Uh, and what you were just talking about, it, it, you know, right after the war is 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 won, people are like, oh, you know, let's not really talk about that. But throughout American history, it's not really talked about. Why is this a forgotten story? I, I mean, it's a forgotten story because for all the reasons I just said, because historians made sure that we would forget it, right? Because to to remember the story, to pay attention to it, I think shows a much uglier side of the war and of American origins, right? And so it's, it's a story that we kind of have to forget. 
in order to ennoble our the origins of our country. Uh, and so I think that you know the the emphasis was all on the side of hey, how can we bury this story? Not hey, how can we take an honest look at what happened here? And what do you think? So speaking of New York City specifically, what do you think this story says about about New Yorkers and in their their kind of their conception of their role during the Revolutionary War? Well, I mean, I think there's a wider problem of New York not doing enough to recognize its own its own military history, its own revolutionary history. You know, Boston can talk about all the things that it did before the war. Philadelphia can talk about the meetings of the Continental Congress and Benjamin Franklin. You know, but New York, right? It's built over with huge skyscrapers. Most of the you know area of New York City that existed during the colonial and revolutionary periods. It's really hard to squint your eyes and envision the landscape of what it would have looked like in the 18th century. You know, New York City got uh, uh, made its myths about commerce and money making. You know, a, a, and all these things. It wasn't looking backwards at its colonial or revolutionary past. It was occupied by the British, right? And so, you know, that makes it a sort of uncomfortable story to retell. But at the same time, I think that story should be retold because it gives us a, a wider and broader and more interesting way of looking at the revolutionary past. It gives us a way of talking about African-Americans, Hessian soldiers, loyalists, women. Uh, you know, if we broaden our scope to, the, you know, New York State as a whole, you know, na the Native American role during the revolution. I mean, New York City, New York State and New York City are really interesting ways to tell a story about the revolution, just not a bedtime story of the revolution, uh, to use the words of the late Jan Lewis. So again, it might not be the most comforting narrative of the revolution, but it is a more interesting narrative, and I think a more intellectually honest one, to look at the full story of what happened to New York during the revolutionary years. Yeah. And you know, I'm very curious about, about how New Yorkers and, and New York City historians uh, have talked about this event. So I, I grew up in uh, Northwest Indiana, in rural Indiana. And when I went to school, you know, I don't think we ever talked about New York City during the American Revolution. It was Philadelphia. It was Boston. You know, it, it, it was, like I just mentioned, it was Valley Forge. And I don't even think it was, it was until I saw, there was, um, did you ever see the show on, on AMC Turn, which was about Washington? Spies? You know, I still, have, I still haven't done it. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I had well, I had the author of the book uh on this this podcast. Mm -hmm. But uh I remember watching that show. I I think I was I don't know, like a early 20s, maybe late teenager or something like that. And I was like, "Huh, I didn't know New York City was like involved in the American Revolution." And you know, the more I you know, more I learned about the American Revolution, the more I realized, "Oh, wow, it had a huge as you write in your book, it had a central role." Uh, extremely important city for so many reasons. And yet, you know, we just, I never heard about it. Yeah. I mean, even, even before the big military campaign of 1776 and the fact that Washington is like hot to reinvade for, you know, all the way up until Yorktown, you know, you, ha you have Stamp Act riots there, you have the Golden Hill riot, you have, uh, um, you know, a, a tea incident in New York, right? Like you have some of the same kinds of political activity uh, as you had in Boston or Newport or other other cities before the war. But again, yeah, like, you know, New York City's historical boosters tried to get that story into the mainstream. But but yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people looked at the fact that it was occupied by the British and were like, nah, you know, let's leave New York City out of the story. It's too complicated. People won't be able to wrap their minds around it. Yeah. And, you know, it's so interesting because the very last paragraph of your book, you talk about how in pop culture, people love to see New York City destroyed or, you know, aliens invade or, you know, plague wipes out the whole city. But this story still like it's not, you know, Hollywood hasn't decided to uh, to show the burning down of New York City in well, the Revolutionary War. Maybe this is one of those things where it's kind of like in the back of our minds culturally somehow, even if we're not, you know, looking at it directly, you know, that that somehow it exists in our cultural memory, right? That New York City, uh, 
you know, got de- parts of it got destroyed a few different times, 1776, 1835, 1845. There are other prominent fires that we've, you know, that many people have heard of, like the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, you know, et cetera. Yeah. Um, 9-11, right, is, is an incident of fiery destruction or ladies and gentlemen, the Bronx is burning, right? And so, you know, New York City is destroyed a lot. Actually, like, there are people who uh, who actually cheer the New York fire later on, you know, later historians who are like, good. It's a, it's actually too bad that more of the city didn't burn because let's rebuild in a more modern way, in a more efficient way, in a way that'll be better for business, right? Like out with the old and in with the new, that's what makes New York tick. And so there's there's something to New York that actually like roots for its own destruction in a weird way. Yeah. You know, yeah, and there's, there's, a lot of ways there's so, think about this. so many people too, as, as you talked about, you know, like new Englanders are like, yeah, let the city, let that den of sin burn. You know, <laughs> there's a yeah. lot of people who, uh, who wouldn't mind, um, Washington included. I'm sure who, there are people in Northwest Indiana who would root for that if it happened. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You are, you are not, you are not wrong uh, with that statement. Well, Professor Carp, this has been a terrific interview. Thank you. What, so what do you. What are you working on next? Oh, I don't know yet. I don't know. I kind of okay. want to rest. It's been, you know, uh, I've, had the, I've had the good fortune to speak to a lot of audiences about this. I'm tired. Um, but I mean, some things that really intrigued me in this book were, um, you know, the, the, the actions of people from New London and Wyndham County in Eastern Connecticut were really interesting. And, that, you know, that might be something that I would be interested in exploring further. I, I'm also interested in, I don't know that I would do a loyalist study. But I kind of got interested in, you know, the people who, you know, wanted to keep the empire together and uh, and what their thoughts were, you know, so that's that's another question that I might ponder. Uh, and then I have other side projects that have nothing to do with this story, but other things that I've worked on over the years. So not sure yet. I mean, I really did enjoy writing about the Revolutionary War. So I'm, I'm really going to be thinking about whether there are new stories to tell about it. Because uh, although I don't like telling the, I wouldn't want to tell the same old stories that we've talked about, right? Like, you know, if I can find something new, I'd really like to get back into those archives because they are really fun to work with. Yeah, well, real time feedback here. Uh, I feel like I don't know hardly anything about loyalists during this time period, or I mean, really the British outside of like some of like the major generals. There's this whole book series by uh, Bernard Cornwell, who he wrote about uh, this guy, that's uh, Captain Sharp. And he's in like, he's in like, he's in Wellington's army ah. fighting the French in the Napoleonic Wars. There's like 30 books in this series. There's a lot and of good fiction about the Napoleonic Wars, but probably <laughs> almost, but very little about the War of Independence. Americans have written about the War of Independence, but it's hard, right? Because you can't, it, like, it's so hard to make that story interesting because you always default to look how patriotic they all were. And especially now that we have taken a more clear eyed look at what the American army did to indigenous people, you know, and the fact that it, we became a slaveholding republic, you know, like that, that makes it hard also, right? You know, because look at the contortions people have to twist themselves into, like in the Patriot, oh, you know, we're not slaves, we work for wages, you know, on this South Carolina plantation. It's like, come on, that like, scene, we need to I, make Mel, Mel Gibson look patriotic, you know, because I otherwise think about we don't that. think an American is, uh, audience can stand it. It's crazy. I think about that scene all the time because when I was growing up, I was, I, <laughs> you know, I saw that movie and I was like, wow. Like, let's look at, you know, the American Revolution. And it's funny you bring that up. I was talking to a, a professor, his name's Woody Holton. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and he wrote a book about the the overlooked peoples during the American Revolution. And we talked about the movie The Patriot and um, how the stories, how we've got all these myth makers, just like you were talking about. We've got all these myth makers that, in American society who have I've told these stories about the revolution and how it happens and everyone is just, you know, these, these, everyone, everyone on the American side is like the good guy doing good things. And it's, it's a lot of things are explained away, such as this scene where, where people are like, no, we're freed people working this land. It was a really interesting story. I think during World War One, somebody tried to make a movie that made the British look really bad. And because the United States was allied with Great Britain by then, they actually destroyed all copies of the movie because it was it was actually unpatriotic even to show the British as bad guys. And so again, like, could we ever do like a good, honest movie of the revolution? I don't know. You know, 
I, I mean, look, Hamilton, you know, I don't know. Let's, it, it talks about the war a bit. So, it, it, you know, and that was commercially successful and, uh, you know, people still have problems with it, but it, it also got a lot of things reasonably accurate. So, uh, you know, I don't know, like, will that inspire future good work on the Revolutionary War? Will we have the kind of great fictional tellings that the British have been able to have about the Napoleonic Wars? I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, for if you decide to, I I learned so much from this book about an event that I, I didn't know anything about. So hopefully your next book, if you choose to write about the British or loyalists or whatever, I'm sure it'll be a topic that I know nothing about. And I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'll am i be waiting in line at the bookstore. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. Well, where can, are you, if people want to find you, if they want to follow you, are you on social media? Yeah, on Twitter, I'm Ben Carp, um, and that tends to be the handle that I try to use. I am on, um, what is it, Mastodon and Post News. Uh, I tend to find those pretty sleepy. I've got a LinkedIn account. So uh, yeah, I'm in the book. People can find me. Uh, and then I have a website, benjamincarp.com, that'll lead you to various places. Perfect. Uh, well, Professor Carp, uh, thank you so much for coming on today. Again, uh, The Great New York Fire of 1776, A Lost Story of the American Revolution. Yeah, hold it up. There it is. Go buy a coffee. Go check it out from your library. Give this story a read. And um, Professor Carp, thanks so much. Thank you.